Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 7 and connect our the last song that we sang together with what we just heard to a post that I read that Andy Cannon put on Facebook yesterday. Andy had noted that his father and Ann's father passed away a year ago yesterday. And my father passed away yesterday, 17 years ago. And God brings us through these trials. Those are trials to lose, lose a dad. But God does make all things new. And I, I know where my father is. I know where Andy's father is, Ann's father is. Because of their trust in Christ, they came to him in repentance and faith, asking him to be their savior. God makes all things new. I'm sure you connected that song with the scripture reading. Today, my dad is in the presence of his savior. And in some way, uh, my dad's death was an encouragement to me to be the kind of man that he was. And I still haven't lived up to that, but uh, that's, that's my hope to be the godly man that my father was. Well, we have been in the Gospel of Mark, and we sort of took a break for both Palm Sunday and Easter, but I did use the passages in Mark to preach from those topics. But today we'll truly take a break from that series. Uh, preaching in the series is very good. It helps us to go through the Word of God systematically. And, um, but I think sometimes we can get to the point where oh, it's another, it's another message in Mark. <laughs> so from time to time it's good to step aside uh, from those things for uh, a short time. We'll be back to the Gospel of Mark uh, next week. But for today, we're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 7. And I've titled this message, A Message to Religious Sinners. And I know that we need this message, and I'll tell you why. Because I need this message. I need this kind of reminder. And uh, I'm sure that we all do. So we will be in Jeremiah chapter 7 in, in just a few minutes. It, it, it is important for us to understand the background and author of the book that we are going to look at this morning in order for us to be able to understand how to apply uh, what we're going to hear to our lives. So Jeremiah is the author of the book that bears his name, and he served as both a priest and a prophet. He was actually the son of a priest. He remained unmarried throughout his life, and he has been called the weeping prophet because he lived a life of conflict. Conflict because of his predictions about the judgment of God coming by the way of an invading uh, Babylon. And over the span of his life, he was threatened, he was tried, put in stocks, he was forced to flee from King Jehoiakim, publicly humiliated by a false prophet, and thrown into a pit. You think your life is rough. <laughs> that is a rough life. But he was a man faithful to proclaim the message that God had for his people throughout his life. And he appealed to his countrymen to repent and avoid God's judgment that would come by way of a foreign invader. This ministry spanned over five decades. The spiritual condition of the people to whom he spoke, to whom he preached, was very poor. God's people were involved in idol worship. Some sacrificed their children to the god Moloch in the valley of Hinnon, just outside of Jerusalem. King Hezekiah attempted reform, but his son Manasseh continued child sacrifice along with idolatry, and that continued throughout Jeremiah's lifetime. When King Josiah came along, he, true, 
I'm sorry, he too brought reform, but it only repressed the worst practices outwardly, while the deadly cancer of sin was deep and reflourished after a shallow revival. So religious insincerity, that's a key word or words there, religious insincerity, dishonesty, religious adultery, and injustice prevailed as the norm, not the exception, even through those times when there was some level of reform. And so this book has a couple of themes, and obviously the main theme is the judgment of God. But a secondary theme is God's willingness to spare and bless God's people if they repent. Other themes include God's longing for Israel to be tender toward Him. The, the close and intimate relationship that God had with Israel and that He yearned to keep. And the vital role that God's Word can play in life. So the passage that we are in today is the beginning of Jeremiah's third message to the people and the condemnation of Judah. When we examine a book or a passage like this, we may question, how, how would that apply to us today? After all, we are not worshiping idols. We are not sacrificing children as religious acts to God's. But we may need to realize that we do have idols in our life. Uh, they just happen to be different than the idols of Jeremiah's day. Uh, they are not worshipped as crudely as those were. And we also have gods in our life. We just may not physically bow down to them, but we do have things that are gods in our life. Because an idol or a god would be anything that takes the place of God in a person's life or that moves him out of his rightful place. Christians today, and I think especially American Christians, have all kinds of things that steal their spiritual fervency from the things of God. We have idols today. And you can think in your mind, what are, what are our idols what are the idols that an American Christian could have in his or her life? I can think of the idols of materialism, living for things. The idol of leisure and recreation. That is certainly an idol uh, in the state of Vermont, isn't it? I mean, I love our state. It's a beautiful state, and I love exploring our state. It's one of the things that we do, uh, especially in the spring, summer, and fall. In Vermont, we like to see what God has created for us. But uh, for unbelievers especially, uh, there's the God of uh, recreation and uh, the God of leisure. I mean, we sometimes on our way, uh, my way to church is very, very short. It's a, it's a long walk down the driveway across the, the way, but I, I remember when we lived in Maine, we would uh, be driving to church on Sunday morning. Maine is very similar to Vermont, especially in outdoor recreation, and uh, we would see folks uh, on Sunday morning as we're driving to church, riding their, their bikes, jogging, the God of physical fitness and health, and um, everyone out and about early on Sunday, but yet in some sense, the roads were almost bare, and people were not driving to church. They were driving to their recreation. And sometimes I'd get silly in the car with my kids, and I would say, not so that people could hear me, but I would say, go to church. <laughs> it's the Lord's day. Worship the Lord. We have all kinds of gods that can creep up into our life. And then we have the God of self, right? Right? Uh, we may not bow down to these idols, but in many ways we let those things replace God in our hearts. or they, they sort of move God out of that rightful place that He should have in our life. And they begin to have first place in our life. They begin to take first priority. We don't sacrifice our children to pagan deities, but we sacrifice them to the gods of this world. Did, did you hear what I just said? 
We don't sacrifice our children to pagan deities, but we may be sacrificing our children to the gods of this world. Christian parents, raise your children for God. To have a trust in God, a faith in God, a complete dependence in God, and to love God with all of their heart and to serve Him. Many people today believe that they can be religious and adulterous. What do I mean by that? I'm talking about spiritual adultery. There's a passage of scripture, it might even be in Jeremiah, where uh, it says that the people of God went whoring themselves to other gods. It's a, it's a very um, verbal uh, illustration, isn't it, of what the people had done. So when I talk about uh, being religious and adulterous, I mean they push God out of their lives and they turn to other things to satisfy themselves. And some believe that as long as they come to church, they're good. I'm spiritual. I go to church. But yet live in religious insincerity. And as we move along through this passage, you'll see what we mean by religious insincerity. And some are dishonest with themselves and deceive themselves into thinking that, well, I have, I have, I have some God in my life, so I'm spiritual. I'm good. Years ago, a survey was done that ended up showing a dichotomy between what people said they believed and how they lived. 84% of people said they believed in God, yet only 10% indicated that God has a great deal of influence on how they live. See a problem with that? <laughs> you see, there is still plenty of religion today, but religion is irrelevant when it comes to how some people live their lives. And I wonder how many here today in this place claim a faith, but it has little to no real relevance in their life. And I have to tell you that that would be false religion. If you claim a faith that has no influence in your life, it has no relevance in your life, it's a false religion. How many Christians today attend church, but their lives are not influenced or changed by what they hear? How many Christians today think that they are spiritual because of what they do, but yet their hearts are far from God? And really, this is the message that Jeremiah is giving to God's people back in that day. In Jeremiah 7, we see the failure of external religion. We see what happens when people attempt to worship but don't genuinely have a heart for God. We see what happens when we do not give God His rightful place and fill our lives with all of our fleshly desires. So notice with me what happens to such people as we begin in Jeremiah chapter 7. And we'll see, first of all, their worship does them no good. Religious sinners, their worship does them no good. So I'm going to read, you can follow along with me, chapter 7, verses 1 to 4. It says, Then the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there his word, and say, hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. See, three times a year, the Jewish men were required to go up to the temple in Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts. The temple in that situation would have been very busy, very crowded. But from what we're reading here in Jeremiah, there are very few true worshipers there. The prophet Jeremiah stood at the temple gate. Now imagine that. He's standing at the gate of the temple and he's preaching a message as people are going in to worship. 
Here Jeremiah delivers a message that their worship does them no, God, no good. They believe they could worship the false gods and Jehovah at the same time. These people believed the lie that they could live in sin and still go to the temple and worship a holy God. They believed the lie of the false prophets that assured them that the presence of God's temple guaranteed God's blessing and protection. That's why those three phrases, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. That somehow that temple is guaranteeing God's blessing and his presence in their life. I was thinking about this. Could you imagine if God placed a preacher outside the doors of this church as we were coming in this morning to preach a needed message to this congregation to tell us that our worship does us no good because we have come to believe the lie that we can have the gods of this world and claim to worship Jesus as well And then to warn us that just because we come into this auditorium and go through motions of worship, that we are not spiritual and do not have God's presence and protection and blessing. Wow. Do you see what Jeremiah was doing? Could you imagine if God had to do that here? We need to understand that outward acts of piety without inward integrity do not please God. Sacred works and sacred acts are nothing in the sight of God when the heart is not right. Our church attendance without a sincere love for God evidenced by acts of genuine faith do do not please God. Now notice verses 9 to 11. Verses 9 to 11. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. We cannot continue in sin and claim to worship God. We cannot continue in sin and say, I attend church and pray, therefore I am spiritual. We cannot live like the world Monday through Saturday and then walk into church on Sunday, go through the motions of worship, and then feel really good about ourselves for doing so. I went to church. We see that the worship does them no good. We see that the prayers of religious sinners do them no good. And so look at verse 16 of chapter 7. Therefore do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. Not only is the prayer of the sinner no good, But God tells the prophet not to pray for this rebellious and unrepentant people. His wrath has come. The time for mercy has ceased. And judgment is going to come upon these people. We see that the sacrifice of religious sinners do them no good. Look at verses 21 to 23. Verse 21, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat meat. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this is what I commanded them saying, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk in all the ways that I have commanded you that it may be well with you. Our outward motions without an obedient heart mean nothing to God. God tells the people they might as well quench the fire, take the offering, take it home, eat the meat for self-nourishment because their actions without obedience do not please Him. And that's saying something. 
Because God eventually does give the people all of these uh, ways in which they are to worship him and to sacrifice to him. But here he's saying, I don't want your sacrifices because your heart is not there. Your obedience is not there. Verse 23 emphasizes obedience over outward meaningless acts. God desires us to walk in his ways over performing religious acts. God's desire for us above all else is obedience to him. Faith and obedience to him. And this passage reminds me of the strong rebuke that Samuel gave to King Saul when he had disobeyed the voice of the Lord and took the spoils of war. Do you remember that passage? And boy, Saul, he really, he, he tried to rationalize his disobedience. Well, Samuel, I took those things so that I might offer them to God in worship. And what did God say? Samuel told him to obey is better than to sacrifice. And then told the king that he was rebellious. He said, your rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Christian, we are to obey God. And we show him that we love him by our obedience. Right? Do you love God? Obey him. <laughs> you want to show God you love him? Obey him. We see that the sin of religious sinners condemns them. And for this, we'll go to now chapter 8 and look at verses 4 to 7. So if you'll turn there, chapter 8, verses 4 to 7. Moreover, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, Will they fall and not rise? Will one turn away and not return? Why has the people slidden back Jerusalem in a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I listened and heard, but they did not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. Even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times, and the turtle dove, the swift, and the swallow observe the time of their coming, but my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. And so Jeremiah is using analogies from human life to illustrate his point. He's taking illustrations of nature and trying to make a point, making a very good point. He says, when people fall down, they get back up. Could you imagine if this morning when I came to move the microphone out of the way and I came to the first step? And I tripped on it and fell down. And then I just laid there. And just laid there. And at first you might think, wow, he really hurt himself. But I just look over at you and say, it's okay, I'm okay. But I continue to lay there. <laughs> I said, Pastor Randy, please come up to the front. <laughs> Let's get the point. When people fall down, they get up again. Look at the other illustration. If they find themselves walking on the wrong path, they go back and get on the right path. Right? There's probably many hikers in, in this congregation. Have you ever gotten on the wrong path? What did you do? Well, let's just stay on the wrong path. Let's just... No! <laughs> You go back, you look at that poorly drawn map that you had in your pocket, <laughs> and you say, somewhere we got on the wrong path. We need to return to get on the right path. See, I was in Maine for nine years, the Appalachian Trail that goes up into that northern part of the state. You do not want to get off the path because you may never find the path again. When we get on the wrong path, we turn around and we get on the right path. The implication is that if people are sensible about everyday matters, 
Why can't they be sensible about eternal matters, especially if the consequences are much worse? Here's the point. If you fall into sin, and you will, how do you know that, Pastor Rob? Because I know me. If we fall into sin, get up. If you are headed in a direction with your life that is contrary to God's ways and plan, and you will, turn around and get on the right path. Turn from that selfish, worldly way and set your direction toward God. Say, God, keep me on the right path. May I stay on the right path. Jeremiah compares the unrepentant sinner to animals. He says in verse 6 that horses will rush into battle and danger. Why? That's what they do. They obey their, their owner, the soldier that sends them into battle. But people created in the image of God ought to know the danger of heading into the dangers of sin. And continuing in sin. And then in verse 7 he implies that the unrepentant sinner is not even as smart as the birds. That's kind of insulting, isn't it? God gave instinct to birds to know the time of migration. But God's rebellious people refuse to obey his laws. Friends, we ought to be as obedient to divine instruction as birds are to their natural instinct. At some point in our lives as Christians, it ought to be a natural instinct just to walk in the ways of God and obey Him. Oh, we'll falter, but when we do, we get back up. We get on the right path. At least that's what we should do. Let us all realize that when we sin, there are consequences. We've all heard the statement, right? You can choose to sin, but you cannot choose the consequences of sin. Unrepentant sin leads to God's judgment. That's the bad news. Here's the good news, folks. But a sorrowful sinner that comes to God repentant over their sin receives God's forgiveness. And they receive God's grace. Notice, not only did they refuse to repent... They rejected God's word. And that would be in verse 9 of chapter 8. Verse 9. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? This morning we all possess a copy of God's word. It may be in your hands right now. It may be in your lap right now. It might be on your electronic device. In your home, there might be six or seven or eight copies of God's Word on shelves and on the, the nightstand. Hopefully it's not full of dust, right? In my office, I, I don't know how many copies of the Bible I have there. There are many. We, have, we possess many copies of the Word of God the important question for us to consider is, do we practice the Scriptures? Do we practice the Scriptures? Today, the Bible is still the bestseller, at least the last time I checked. The Bible is still a bestseller, but that doesn't keep America from its moral and spiritual decline, does it? The Jews of Jeremiah's day believed that the mere possession of God's law made them religious and wise. But that's not true. Believer, you must practice the Scriptures. My mind went to James. What good is God's Word if we listen to it or read it and we don't live by it? What good is it? So Jeremiah chapter 1, 22 to 25 says, But be ye doers of the Word. Some of you have this passage memorized. Be ye doers of the word, not what? Not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. 
For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. I imagine that most of us, if not all of us this morning, at some point looked into a mirror. Some of you look like you looked into a mirror. (laughs) I looked into a mirror a couple of times this morning. Imagine looking into the mirror and that mirror revealing that there's something that needed attention. And yet you walked away from the mirror and you forgot what needed attention. Folks, when we look into the Word of God, it is showing us needs. We need to give attention. And we don't just look into it. We don't just hear it. But then we do it. We make the changes necessary as the Word of God speaks into our life. We can't just be hearers of the Word of God. We must be doers. Interestingly, after that passage about being doers of the Word, not hearers only, the next verse gives us an example of a man that thinks he is religious. And if you know James chapter 1, he thinks he's religious, but he can't control what his tongue and then verse 26 says that that man deceives his own heart and his religion is in vain wow that is a sad commentary isn't it merely having God's word or reading it or listening to it preached does not make you spiritual practicing it applying it and obeying it does. And then the people relied on a false security. Look at chapter 8, verse 11. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Their prophet And priest who claimed to be speaking in the name of the Lord spoke a message of good news and peace. So while Jeremiah is outside the gate and he's trying to speak truth, the guy inside is saying, Peace, everything's great, peace. Meanwhile, you can hear the hooves of the horses of the invading Babylonians coming in to conquer these people, to invade them as a judgment of God. Oh, but peace. Everything's great. Everything's good. No, it's not. In reality, they had no peace. The judgment of God was coming. And then we see their sin leads to judgment. The sin of religious sinners leads to judgment. Now we're going to look at three verses here. And so I want you to look down at your Bibles of chapter 8. We're going to look at 13. Then I'll read 16. And then I'll read verse 20. So 8.13 says, I will surely consume them, says the Lord. No grapes shall be on the vine nor figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade, and the things I have given them shall pass away from them. Look at verse 16. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones, for they have come and devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell in it. And then verse 20. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. These verses are blending three voices together. There is God's voice of judgment, that's verse 13. There is the people's voice of despair, that's verse 16. 
And then there is Jeremiah's voice of anguish, and that's verse 20. As we saw the ruin of the nation approaching. God says, hey, your fields will be ruined, your cities will be destroyed, and the people will be killed or taken captive. So that's the message to religious sinners. Their worship does them no good and is no good to God. He takes no pleasure in it. Their prayers do them no good. Their sacrifice is not satisfying or pleasing to God. Instead, their sin condemns them and brings the judgment of God. Perhaps some here this morning need to realize that religion alone will not please God. Religion alone will not please God. To worship in a religion does one no good unless they worship the only true God and worship Him genuinely. If there's anyone here today that has never turned from the sin of false religion or empty religion or has never placed their faith in Jesus Christ alone to satisfy God's demand for righteousness, today could be a day of salvation for you. And if after the message this morning you will come to me, I would love nothing more than to open God's word and to show you that right now, God is holding back his judgment for us. This is a time of grace. God offers mercy to us. But that day of death, that day of judgment is coming. But praise God, he has offered us a way to be restored to fellowship with him. To be forgiven of our sin. And that way is through the life of his son, Jesus Christ. The perfect God-man that came to this earth to die to die on the cross, to take our sin upon him. And as we celebrated last Sunday, he paid that debt and he rose again. And he conquers sin and he conquers death. And then he offers to us a free gift called salvation. And all we have to do is receive it. In faith, trusting in it, in obedience, and calling out to him, forgive me of my sin. Come be my Lord and my Savior. And then all things are made new. You are made new. The Bible talks about regeneration. He actually gives you new birth, new life, eternal life. And in Christ, you, have, you receive all the benefits of his life, his death, and his resurrection. And so this sounds like, wow, Pastor Rob, this is a really negative message this morning. The wrath of God on the religious sinners. No, here's the good news, folks. There was a time in my life, oh, I was rebellious in my teenage years. And I'm thankful for a God that did not allow me to enjoy the consequences of sin. And the consequences of sin began to pile up in my life. And I knew better because I heard the gospel many, many times. Never really submitted to it in genuine trust, faith, and obedience. But then I realized, McElwain, you're a rebel against God you are fighting God you need to submit and obey him and that's when I genuinely came in faith and repentance asking God to forgive me of my sin and to be my savior and that is the free gift of salvation that God offers to all men he doesn't desire that anyone perish, but at all come to him in repentance and faith. 
For believers here today, would you consider the fact that worship, prayer, and sacrifice do not please God if it is done externally, but the heart is not right with God? And so I would ask us, as I have asked myself, to consider my heart. Would you consider your heart? What is the condition of your heart today? Others, would you consider today any idols in your life that have taken the place of God or that have pushed God out of the central place and the love of your heart? Perhaps in each one of us there is a need for some sort of revival today. God has done little works of revival in my life throughout my Christian life because you know what? Sometimes I move away. Oh, not, not move away from salvation, not move away from me. But sometimes I struggle with sin. Do you? (laughs) Yes. And sometimes God has to do a little work of revival in my life to say, McElwain, you have fallen down. Get up. That's what believers do. They get up. They don't stay down. And God forgives them. McElwain, you've kind of diverted onto a path that's not the path that I have for you. And God has to do a work. And it's my job to submit and obey and return. Let us all remove from our thinking the idea that if we go through certain motions, we're spiritual. (laughs) Folks, it's true. If, If you are right with God, There will be acts of obedience and faith. You will live for Him. You will please Him. But just the idea that, well, I come to church Sunday, I have a Bible, I read it once in a while, yet at the same time, it has no relevance in your life. It has no current relevance in your life. You're not obeying, you're not being doers of the Word, hearers only. Do not deceive yourself. Be hearers and doers of the Word of God. So what we all face this morning is the question of whether or not our outward acts of worship are genuine. Will we be honest with ourselves and examine ourselves this morning? Folks, it's very important that we respond to the Word of God when we read it and when we hear it. And I would say to you that we always do. Sometimes the response is to get up, turn from the seat, walk out the doors. And that response is not responding, but it's, it's a response. Let us not be the types of Christians that can sit and hear preaching from week to week and it has no particular influence and produces no change in our life. In this moment, will we ask God to forgive us, to cleanse us, and to restore us if needed? Will we ask for a clean and pure heart that will result in genuine love and obedience to Him so that our outward acts of worship will truly be pleasing to Him because He does desire our worship. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, Lord, I thank You for Your Word and for the examples of Your Word. Father, help us not to be like Your disobedient and rebellious people In Jeremiah's day, Father, help us to remain obedient and faithful to you and genuine worshipers. Father, I pray if there's anyone here this morning that's never become a genuine worshiper, never has come to you through your son, Jesus Christ, recognizing their sin and that their sin is an offense to you. And that will bring your wrath unless they repent and turn to you. May today be 
a a day of salvation for someone, Lord. May you renew in the hearts of believers a proper love and obedience to you and a genuineness of faith and service to our great God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.